Value Town Fund is proud to present to you a very exciting stock today. The most watched company, perhaps, in the entire market, or maybe the entire world. That's Apple. It was chosen to be reviewed by you fine folks at YouTube, partly because they recently had a court case against them with Epic, and also they're introducing their next iPhone 13. I guarantee you there's some very spicy things here. Thanks again to the fine subscribers of Patreon for continuing to fund this show so that I can take these potentially insane plays, but founded in reason, on the Valley Town Show. As usual, we begin on Weeble. Thanks for signing up using my affiliate link with Weeble. It's with those signups and you depositing 100 bucks that I get a share of random stock, but it seems like it's Jeff each time when you sign up. You also get a free stock. Yours is probably going to be worth less than Jeff. So I'm going to begin by selling my Jeff stock and then doing the usual buy the index funds. Valley Town Fund is aiming for a 40% of Vanguard total stock index fund of the U.S. and 10% of Vanguard total international index fund. Uh, so 50% of the money put in always goes towards these funds. Nice, that just put me over five shares of the Vanguard total stock market index fund. Without further ado, let's jump into the largest company by market capitalization in the world for now. The good news is I don't really have to explain what Apple does, because as the largest market cap in the world, and as one of the companies with the largest moat around it, as Warren Buffett loves calling it, people know and love this brand. It's why you can always rest assured that when you buy stocks, when you buy blue chip stocks, you can just buy Apple and it'll go up in the long term if you're a long term investor. But in case you didn't know what Apple was, that's the United States company in the technology sector. It sells hardware storage and peripherals, although this doesn't fully explain what it does now. It's uh, quickly becoming more and more a services company. iPhone is the biggest product that Apple makes right now. It also makes Mac, personal computers, iPad, AirPods, which are ludicrously, I, I learned this, uh, and I was very shocked to actually learn it. AirPods, a ludicrously expensive headphone thingy where you just, AirPods, where you put them in your ear and you like pay Apple an ent enormously amount of money, which, which actually shows how powerful of a company Apple is. Uh, they have this Apple TV thing, which isn't doing that well right now, but it doesn't matter. Uh, they got this watch. They're looking to get into this Apple Pay thing. And the App Store. The App Store is a, a really big deal. We'll touch on that. The fact that Apple can charge that much for their stuff, uh, you know, just because it's got the little Apple logo on it, anyone could have a phone, but because it has an Apple logo, you can charge... This isn't actually an exaggeration. You can charge $1,100 for it. They can charge companies... 30% uh, whenever anyone buys stuff on their app store, or can they? <laughs> Anyways, the point is, this is the type of company that Warren Buffett loves. So when Warren Buffett puts 40% of his portfolio into Apple out of all the stuff he's invested in, cash not included, he might know what he's doing. The point is, this is a company with a huge moat, great brand, excellent company. The problem, perhaps, with buying Apple now is when you look at this five-year, ten-year chart, is ten years, it's gone up 1,172%. It's arguable where it's justified until, like, was it fair here at 500%? Was it fair here at 1,000%? Is it fair here at 1,200%? I actually think it's mostly around here, this particular run-up, that it's a little bit questionable. Stock's really good, and Apple stock should increase over time. But the problem is you can buy a great company for too high a price. And in this episode, we try to see if the price is right for Apple. 
Apple does uh, sit currently at its near all-time high after a one-year rise. Uh, wish I could have a two-year chart here, but the two-year chart has been amazing. It's more than doubled in less than two years uh, since the bottom. And you would think that by looking at this one year, uh, that going up 35.71% is pretty good. However, compared to uh, the other FANG stocks, Apple, it's middle and actually stalled a little bit and certainly was stalling quite a bit before this run up. This is a really good particular day to do this review. They recently had a big epic case. Well, it turns out that their iPhone 13 event uh, also just happened. And... Don't worry, when we read this very unbiased article by Sean Hollister, you'll see how great Apple is. I think this article is so great that I kind of want to read it all. The iPhone 13 event was a case study in Tim Cook era product refinement. For the past 10 years, Tim Cook's greatest accomplishment as Apple CEO has been more of the same. More iPhones, more iPhone accessories, more apps, and so much more money. While the Mac and iPad have occasionally fallen into disrepair, the company keeps coming back with new reasons to buy its greatest hits every year. And this year's iPhone 13 event is a near perfect case study in how far refinement can take you. The iPhone 13 is effectively the iPhone 12S, an iterative incremental update to last year's phones instead of something that feels brand new. But oh, what an update! What company wouldn't dream of being able to say they improved the processing power and the battery life and the cameras and the displays and the storage capacity and the connectivity and the design in the course of a single year, all without changing the price one bit? In 2021, the same $829 you paid last year now buys you twice the storage, a whopping 2.5 additional hours of quoted battery life, more 5G bands, an additional 175 nits of brightness over the f iPhone 12 plus the 47% larger sensor and center shift stabilization system that was previously exclusively available in the 1099 iPhone 12 Pro Max. This year's iteration is so compelling that I'm vaguely tempted to upgrade my perfectly good iPhone 12 mini to get that better camera with sensor shift and an additional hour or so of battery life. I probably won't, since the announcement means the resale value of my existing phone has likely already tanked. If I do worry, Apple might still cut off the mini next year due to reportedly lackluster sales. If I had an iPhone 11 or earlier, it'd be a no-brainer. This guy sounds like the biggest Apple fanboy of all time, and this guy is not buying the new iPhone 13. Now granted, the usual iPhone upgrade cycle is like every two years that you might get it. So like, it's understandable. Of course you don't like, you don't buy the iPhone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, actually. Fun note about Apple, they skipped some numbers in between so that their numbers were bigger. That's a true story. But you don't buy every single one of them, unless you do. Some of Apple's customers actually do that. But you know what I love doing in this particular article? We can uh, read the comments. Hey, hey, go, go, go Apple, Sean. It's perfectly iterative, and we think you're going to love it. Sean, this was the most boring Apple event since the launch of the iPhone 7. Who are you trying to convince that this is a worthy upgrade cycle, us or yourself? This is a reach. Did we really need this article? You could have said the same thing for every iPhone. Boy, it must be nice to be Apple. Even when you have a marginal upgrade, this site will bend over backwards to try and spin it as a great thing. This article, same, same site, The Verge. Uh, John Porter writes, the iPhone 13 is a pitch-perfect iPhone 12S. Uh, Apple's S-year iPhones never went away, it just stopped advertising them. Why? Because bigger numbers are better. So about this iPhone 13. Consumers have noticed far from upgrading to the latest iPhone every year, as of 2019, CNBC reported that US customers were waiting an average of over two years to upgrade their phones, while in the UK, people were waiting almost 28 months. At the time, these figures were all trending upward, and it seems safe to assume that they've grown even longer in the two years since. It was also around this time that iPhone sales started to plateau, and Apple stopped reporting on iPhone sales numbers, opting instead to bundle their numbers in with other device categories. That doesn't mean that Apple has given up on the idea of selling you a new phone every year, far from it. If branding this year's phones as the iPhone 13 tells us anything, 
said Apple is more keen than ever to convince its customers to upgrade by branding this year's phones as an all-new range as opposed to a more modest update to the Phone 12. The slowing progress of smartphone tech means that Apple can't afford to rest on its laurels with an S-branded device. Everything needs to be brand new and as exciting as possible. So yes, this year's iPhones could and arguably should have been branded as the iPhone 12S, but the smartphone industry has changed and Apple has changed with it. Uh, Part of the article that I skipped was pointing out that most smartphones, like... They're there. You don't really need that much more functionality. Yes, the iPhone 13 is better. It's a higher quality phone. It's uh, less priced than the iPhone 12. But if you have an iPhone 12, I think most people aren't going to buy an iPhone 13. I mean, even this guy, Sean Hollister, isn't buying an iPhone 13. If people have bought the iPhone 12, then they're less likely to buy the iPhone 13. Remember that. Okay, now for the main reason why people wanted me to look at Apple. Uh, Recently, there was a big court case. Uh, Epic versus Apple. Epic Games sued Apple because they weren't allowed in their app store because Epic Games tried to get around the Apple 30% cut for every single transaction that happened on the Epic application, basically dragging people to their own place to pay uh, for the epic skins from Fortnite and all that stuff. Apple won 9 out of the 10 counts. However, importantly, there was mostly this anti-steering regulation added. Under the new order, Apple is permanently restrained and enjoined from prohibiting developers from including in their apps and their metadata buttons external links or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms in addition to in-app purchasing and communicating with customers through points of contact obtained voluntarily from customers through account registration within the app. What does that mean? Apple is allowed to make their um, customers, their customers being like these app companies which are putting apps on the apple store they're probably going to be allowed to put in a contract hey you still have to have this uh, method of payment where we apple you know control the payment service and we still get the 30 percent cut and i don't know if it's going to stay at 30 percent however i doubt that apple can stop this clear anti-steering thing which is that the below this buy this and pay this amount for it the company can also have another button which is say or you can buy here using our company store instead in this judgment course also it was reviewed uh, it was revealed that most of apple's income comes from game companies which i am very attuned to In fact, 70% of the entire app store's revenue and 98% of in-app purchase revenue is from gaming, our world here. That's a lot of money. All these free-to-play games, you probably knew that they make a lot of money. Well, when Apple gets paid 30% of that money, Apple makes a lot of money, and Apple likes that. And free-to-play companies like Epic Games hate that. 98% of recurring revenue from in-app purchases is coming from these game stores. And now, yes, Apple is still going to be able to make a a very large amount of their money through the button because it's very convenient to just press the button and then pay instead of having to go to the company website and then probably like have to click through a few other things. But 30% is a lot. Anyways, this was a big deal. And after this judgment, it was kind of a surprise judgment. Uh, This was the effect on Apple stock, showing that markets are kind of efficient. A lot of people were watching this judgment case, apparently, and the moment that was announced, uh, people had their trades, institutions probably, uh, they had their trades in place. They were like, sell it now. Anyways, it's a big deal. Especially since the App Store, I had mentioned that uh, Apple used to be a hardware company, but more and more of its income, and certainly a very large part of its big profit segment comes from the services where they just sell apps. It costs them like almost nothing to sell an app, and it certainly doesn't cost them anything when people buy 
stuff on Raid Shadow Legends. There's no wonder that Apple is a very popular company to invest in and is the number one company on the S&P 500 or number one company in the world. Like, look at that revenue. That's a lot of revenue, $274 billion. Uh, and they make a profit margin, gross profit margin of 38% on that. Uh, they casually pocketed $57 billion in profit last year, just steadily trending up. Some bumps along the way. Because they have so much money, they're buying back lots of stock because they actually can't use that money to grow their business any further. It's that big a business. It's just like it's not very possible to grow the business much. Uh, that is a lot of shares bought back. When companies buy back their stock, you own a much bigger part of Apple. Every share of Apple you had 10 years ago is... 1.5 times as many shares due to their share buybacks. Well, let's do our discounted cash flow analysis. Now, the moment we load this in, uh, hmm, fair value 145, current stock price, 145.84, round it to 146, current stock price 149, uh, you might come to the conclusion, well, that's slightly overvalued, but that's okay. Uh, Apple's a really good company, but there's a few glaring issues with this. Uh, issue number one, because the analysts, uh, there's not as much coverage during the fourth year and fifth year. This, these two numbers seem outlandish, uh, so I'm going to bring those back in line by just putting the growth to 3%, and I'll keep the percentage of revenue of earnings to be, yeah, that looks about right, that's fine. And then the fair value is actually 8.6% uh, overvalued. And you're like, ah, 8.6%, you know, it's Apple, it'll make it back. I just have to be a long-term holder. That's fine. Well, I'm going to put in my usual adjustment for discount rate. So this is assuming that you're okay with a 7% rate of return for Apple. However, I'm not. That's basically the return of the S&P. Beta can probably range between 1 and 1.2 here, uh, because I believe that the beta of Apple is actually closer to 1.2, which means that it's about 20% more volatile than the S&P 500. Uh, you deserve a little bit more of a return for that risk. Uh, a discount rate of 8% might be more uh, acceptable, which means that I would like Apple to go up 8% each year. Uh, so I'm changing the discount rate from 7% to 8%. And that will change the fair value from 136 to 131. And now it's 11.6% overvalued. And it's like, eh, whatever, it's Apple. We'll pay that much. That's fine. Uh, but now here's the big one. I find the EBITDA exit multiple, and this is a five-year analysis, so it's this is the exit multiple we think that you're going to pay... Uh, 19 times earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. But for every single company that I've done, I have looked at the historical EBITDA multiple. And you can notice that there were times where Apple's enterprise to EBITDA multiple were as low as 6. Recently, it's 24. That seems really, really high. With numbers like this uh, so consistently, uh, with like only a few fluke numbers, especially this year, like this year it made sense. You can pay a higher price to earnings ratio. Uh, PE ratio is the very commonly thing looked at. You can pay a higher one when you actually expect earnings to spike up a bunch when you have a high growth company. But here's the thing, and I didn't quite point this out on the discounted cash flow analysis. Apple is not a high-growing company. Uh, it had a massive growth percentage during this particular year uh, because it was compared to the last year where there was no new iPhone release. And this year had the iPhone release in, I believe it was the first quarter. Uh, keep in mind that Apple reports as in their fourth quarter ends on September. So iPhone 12 came out. Uh, October 2020 that got lumped into the 2021 it was delayed due to COVID and that's why this has such a high growth number compared to this one and the iPhone 12 it did really well uh, but that was under the following conditions 
and this is my big theory, by the way, whenever you do a discounted cash flow analysis, sure, you can just use the numbers, but you can also come up with your own story if you want to be extra spicy. If you think that the story that's being written here isn't quite accurate. I think that this is pull forward purchasing. Uh, the fact that people bought so many iPhones in early uh, part of this particular year, uh, they bought a bunch of iPhone 12s. That means they're less likely to buy the iPhone 13. And that might actually mean that these rosy assumptions for the final quarter of this particular year when they're selling the iPhone 13, maybe that doesn't go as well. Because even this Sean Hollister guy, he's not buying the iPhone 13, he has an iPhone 12. But I always want to make sure to read every single piece of information possible. Like, don't just bring up the pieces of information that support your point. Uh, this particular article was pointed out to me, uh, written just today, actually. Apple's initial iPhone 13 pre-orders in China surpassed last year's as market offers fewer premium handsets amid Huawei's decline. But that might be because the people in China did not purchase the iPhone 12 as much. So my point is this. Uh, I am just using the analyst numbers here, but I think it's important to think, are the analysts right? And if the analysts are wrong, do you think the analysts are above or below the rating? And that's generally how I start off on doing these discounted cash flow analyses. I smooth out the last two years because there's generally not enough analyst coverage. I generally assume that the analysts will know better than me unless I have a really deep understanding of the industry for the next three years. But then I think, are the analysts more likely to be right uh, or wrong? And if they're right or wrong, are they likely to be above or below the prediction? And so far, earnings have been really good, but I think in this case, and disclaimer, I don't actually own any Apple products, so I might be biased against. I'm probably biased against. I actually think that this might be too optimistic. Furthermore, if it is too optimistic, even with these numbers, the upside is still negative. And furthermore, I didn't even go to my finished adjustment yet. I was talking about how the price to earnings ratio was quite high. You pay this high of a ratio when you expect the company to grow a bunch, but I think that this is too optimistic and they're only growing at 3% a year. Furthermore, it will be very difficult to compare 2022 to 2021. So my point is, I think this has actually a significant risk of being overvalued. I'm gonna make four main adjustments to this particular valuation. Uh, I've already done two of them. The first one was I changed the discount rate from 7% to 8%. The second one was I smoothed out the revenue growth during these last two because the analysts probably were particularly bullish, the ones that predicted this far up. Uh, that was a particularly high revenue. The third one I'm going to do is I'm going to change this EBITDA exit multiple, which I think is rather high right now at 19. I believe that it would be much more reasonable to choose these particular years, given that the company looks like it's not growing rapidly, unlike this particular year. So I'm going to set it to 12. That's going to cause what the price of this stock is worth to fall dramatically. Why? Because the exit multiple determines the terminal value. The terminal value, uh, using this model of the five-year discounted cash flow model, assumes essentially that you sell the company after five years at the multiple of earnings. And if you're multiplying by 19, the terminal value is 2.4 trillion dollars whereas if you multiply by 12 it's only 1.5 trillion dollars just to see the gigantic difference in valuation with the old number 131 dollars with the second number 92 dollars uh, 92 dollars that's a 38 percent overvaluation this is fast graphs a cool visual way of showing how price should tend to follow intrinsic value. Uh, this blue line is the theoretical intrinsic value. Currently, let's just set it at all. The black line is the stock price of Apple. Sometimes it's below this blue line, which is what the stock market generally values at. at. Sometimes it's above the blue line uh, because, you know, people get a little bit overexcited. Sometimes there's bad news. They get underexcited. But the point is, it's been going... You know, it's been around this blue line. And now we just reduce this to the 10-year graph. 
And you can see it's followed the line up until somewhere around 2019, where it started to like just drift really far apart. There was this correction during the COVID crash, a very fast correction, just rebounded right straight back up. This looks like a drastic departure from the line, doesn't it? But I am going to point out that not all is lost just because the PE looks really high. Uh, this particular PE here was actually potentially justified. It, it was 34 right here. Earnings were expected to be really good, and they were quite good. Uh, so at some point, uh, PE did go down to 28 over here, and then 27, and then 25. But I think the main folly that has occurred is that this has climbed back to 28, 27 PE when... The normal PE has historically been around 16. Now, you might mention the interest rate right now is at an all-time low. Because during that COVID crash, the Federal Reserve uh, lowered the interest rate down to 0%. Certainly at these all-time low interest rates, where the 10-year bond was only yielding 0.6%, uh, yeah, PEs totally deserve to be really high. As people say, as really experienced investors say, the bond market is actually the most important factor in the stock market. The bond market is like uh, interest rates are gravity to stock prices. When the interest rates are so low, we're basically operating in zero gravity. Price earnings ratio can actually legitimately be this high up. But here's the thing. Uh, interest rates have actually climbed back up to this general 1.6 range. And we do have precedent on what should PE be around 1.6. That's happened around here, it's happened around here. And the answer was PE was 13.6 right there. And PE over here, 18, you know, generously called 20. PE's really high right now. So that supports that the EBITDA multiple, it could be 12 especially if Apple actually misses out on sales targets. This particular model was built uh, by the analysts before they had the ruling, the surprise ruling, that Apple was going to potentially have to steer uh, a really profitable thing away from their business. The annual report from 2020 lists that the revenue from services was $53 billion, 54. And you can see the margin of services is a lot higher than products because it doesn't cost very much to run a website and sell applications. Uh, margin is 66% compared to 32% of products. So this, 53, this $54 billion is at risk. And the numbers were 70% of this $54 billion. Also of note is this ruling only applies to the United States. That's really important. The United States is only about a third of this. So we're going to divide this number by three. $12 billion at risk, noting that it's possible that other countries will follow suit as well then. So that judgment isn't going to affect 2021. Uh, it may apply into 2022. I'm going to say Apple will lose a third of $12 billion. And this revenue is continuing to grow as well, but given that this growth is showing is 3%, you know, I'm just going to be really generous and only lop off $4 billion of revenue and essentially $3 billion of profit uh, each year. You're actually going to see this doesn't really matter that much because this is $379 billion, but uh, hard to say if it's only going to affect Apple by that much. So the conclusion, uh, Apple's overvalued by 39.6%. I actually feel a little bit bad about Apple, and I feel like this might be doing a little too much. I'm, I'm going to give them a pity 14. There. I'd be willing to pay $101 for an Apple share. So the stock price is $149. A particular price right now, $148.77. Uh, as of the 16th. Now, it is also really important, because I did use the analyst numbers to see what the analysts thought. And the analysts, you can see on tip ranks here, actually did have enough time in order to change their price targets, some after the 
showcase of the new Apple product, some after the court ruling. Uh, but all in all, the analysts, you know, these are the professionals. I'm just an amateur investor. Uh, these guys are, by and large, saying, buy this stock. They're setting a price target of $168.29, uh, which is, whenever you read the analyst targets, by the way, uh, this is how much they expect the stock to be next year. So the analysts have this number. Uh, if I discount this back to today, because their number is in next year, uh, I divided by 1.08%. Uh, so their number for the stock is 155.8, which is a little bit higher than 148. Uh, but you know, always check their numbers and see if you think the analyst numbers are correct. I don't think it's a buy. Now, normally, the analysis would just end here. I would just look at it in my personal portfolio and I'd be like, ah, seems overvalued, but it's Apple. Uh, Apple probably demands some sort of premium that I'm not accounting for. I'm just not going to buy it. But this is the value town fund. I have to take a position on every stock. I'm going to short this thing. And this is going to be really exciting. It's going to be the first time I ever short a stock. Now, if I just shorted the stock, that's not good enough. I do think in the long term, Apple goes up. Shorting it and not doing anything with the money would be really silly. I'm going to sell this stock, short it. I don't own any of this stock. I'm going to sell a stock I don't own. I'm going to borrow it from someone. Uh, the borrow cost for Apple stock, which only is shorted 0.59%, by the way, is a very unpopular stock to short. And also, shorting is extremely dangerous. Do your due diligence if you ever short any stocks. I've been invested for a very long time, and I'm only shorting because I have to take a position due to the show being part entertainment. But the good news is because there's so many shares available, it only has a borrowing cost of 0.025%. And what am I going to do with this money? Well, since I don't really have any particular thing in the Valley Town Fund that I particularly want to invest in yet, I'm going to do something really simple but I'm going to invest the money in a low cost index fund. I think the low cost index fund will actually outperform Apple. Uh, let's compare this with the S&P 500, which is going to be the comparison I'm actually going to be putting into the VTI instead, but the Vanguard total stock market index fund is very similar to the S&P 500 in terms of return, uh, almost entirely similar. Uh, you can actually see this pair trade would have just about evened out over the year. And my main point is I think it's going to be moving forward, I believe the S&P will outperform Apple. It's always really important to think about what could go wrong. And the main assumption that I'm making, which is reducing Apple's valuation, is that it is not a growth company. I think that it's going to still remain a very good company and it's going to keep growing, but at a mature rate. What could go wrong? There's quite a lot. You don't necessarily know if they're going to change their current course. And Apple has been known there is a precedent to have changing course. Like, what if I had shorted Apple stock just before they announced the iPhone, uh, where I noticed that, hey, yeah, this iPod thing is doing pretty well, but what can Apple do in the future? They're a mature company now, and they're just going to continue their steady price from now. And then, bam, there comes the iPhone. Well, what about, bam, here comes the iCar, here comes iHealth, here comes iVR. And if any of those take off, Apple turns from a mature company into a growth company. And I am certain that a decent amount of that stock appreciation is due to anticipation of that. When you buy the S&P 500 or when you buy the Vanguard Total Stock Fund, each share of the Vanguard Total Stock Market Fund you buy is 5.2% Apple anyways. In a way, you can call this a hedge. Basically, I'm canceling out an amount of the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund, which is Apple. So there you have it. I'm the next Michael Burry. Value Town Fund stance is I'm going to short one whole share of Apple stock. That's actually a lot because the Value Town Fund is you know about 3,000 bucks. That means I'm taking a short position worth like 5% of my portfolio. I'm going to short one share of Apple, 
Please check the risk below. This order of execute will result in a short position of one shares. Continue. Risk reminder. Short selling is subject to high market risk in the event of extreme market volatility. There's even a risk that your assets may be liquidated. Wow, very spooky. And I'm going to use those $148.74 in order to purchase the VTI. Very exciting. So it's off to the races. I'm rooting for the U.S. stock market to outperform Apple stock, essentially. Just call me Michael Burry the second. It's the big short, where I short one share of Apple. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy content like this and you want to support further of this stuff and you want to see my personal portfolio, uh, check out my Patreon uh, that is what funds the show. All the funds from that go directly into the Valley Town show. I do feel like it's very important to emphasize that I am not personally short Apple, nor would I actually short Apple currently with my level of experience, except that this show is part entertainment and I have to take a position on every single stock. Uh, in reality, most stocks you look at and it's like, eh, close to market price, below market price, don't do anything with it. Uh, but we'll see what comes up next. See, a stock like Apple can be very exciting, even if it is watched by everyone around the world. Perhaps because it is watched all around the world and because so many people believe in it, that's how it got to be what I believe to be overvalued.